study session for the City Council for uh, Wheat Ridge, Colorado for November 20th, 2023. We have two items on our agenda tonight. Item number one is public notice requirements for development related applications. And item number two is appointment process for the presiding judge. We'll begin our meeting as we generally do with public comment. If you would like to comment on this, either, either item one or item two, um, you may do so now. I have no one signed up to speak. If you are joining us on the virtual uh, format, if you would please raise your hand, we will uh, bring you into the meeting. I guess just a moment to see if any hands are raised. Uh, whoever on the IT side is... Uh, we do, we have one hand raised, Don Underwood. Okay, uh, Mr. Underwood, if you would please uh, uh, unmute yourself and give us your first name and your last name and uh, what agenda item you'd like to speak on. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Rachel and Scott for your efforts to bring the community together for a much larger than expected meeting to provide the neighborhood with the answers to their many questions. Unfortunately, our questions were not answered. Okay, ma'am, ma'am, this yes. is not part of the public comment tonight. We're talking about notice requirements. Are, are, and is that what yes. you're speaking on? Yes, I am. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Because I've, Corey asked me for suggestions on how to communicate better with the community, okay. and I found some information out. Will that work? Yes, would you please give me your address? I'm sorry I didn't uh, ask for that earlier. 4601 Teller Street. Okay, you'll have three uh, minutes to so, address the council. Okay, so I guess I won't continue with my thank you. Um, in that meeting, it was stated there'd be a follow-up, which that has not happened, even though all emails were taken. So I'm not sure what the communication breakdown is regarding that. But I also spoke with the United States Postal Service, per Patrick Goff telling me that, and the community in that meeting, the postage was too expensive to have a mailer go out and with that, I have found out from them that you can do a Wheat Ridge All or a Wheat Ridge specific mailing. There is also the option to be more specific and leave out areas. This is called an EDDM, Every Door Direct Mail. If it is just one page of flyer that's eight and a half by 11 without an envelope, the cost is 0.2 per piece. Very reasonable considering the need as you saw for additional communication just in a different form from our leaders and the EDDM has proven to be a great way to communicate. I would like this to be considered for the near future as it is cost effective and ways to connect with the specific areas that I represent. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other uh, speakers joining us online? Okay, we will close our public's uh, comment and go to agenda item number one. This is the uh, public notice requirements for de development related applications. Uh, Mr. Goff, staff report on this item. We do, uh, Lauren Mikulak, our community development director. Okay, Ms. Mikulak. Thank you, um, good evening, thanks for having me. I don't have any slides tonight, but I was gonna talk through some of the content of the memo. Um, as you saw, we don't have a specific staff recommendation, so we'll have plenty of time to sort of discuss your ideas and options. Um, Mr. Dahl and I had the chance to talk through some options, and we had a few more brainstorms since the memo was written, so we'll share those thoughts as well. Um, when this topic of public notice came up, I think uh, it was mentioned at the time that we've worked really hard over the last number of years to expand the way that we, we let people know how things are happening in Wheat Ridge. And so the first half of the memo sort of describes that, expanding letter notice um, in the radius from 300 to 600, expanding from just owners to owners and occupants, increasing the number of signs, um, changing the design of signs, sort of a variety of different uh, procedures and code amendments that we've done. Um, and it's always still a good time to just double check that it's working. Um, there's almost all provisions of the zoning code there's a situation that arises that we didn't anticipate. Um, so I think you're all familiar with the fact that we're here tonight largely because of the letter notice comments that we got related to the Bank of the West property. Um, so just briefly, it was fairly unique, I think, in a few ways, um, which is why it merits a good conversation. It was a city-owned parcel 
um, surrounded by parcels owned by Foothills Regional Housing. It was subject to both a zone change and a sale agreement um, at the same time, which is fairly unique. Uh, it, it's for an affordable housing project, which can be a bit of a lightning rod. And the process of the zone change and the sale was happening at the same time that the first phase of the IVES went vertical, which tends to bring a lot of attention and a sort of acute, what is going on here, I would like to know. And I know some of you got those kinds of comments from neighbors of really wanting to understand what's going on. Um, we have long acknowledged there is no perfect noticing system. Um, I am intrigued by the public comment, and I'll, we'll look that up for a variety of um, potential mailings of a variety of projects. Um, there's nothing, there's no perfect system. We didn't have a month ago the projects and properties map. We're really hoping that that continues to help expand folks' awareness of upcoming public hearings. That's a specific uh, piece of information that goes on there as soon as we schedule a meeting. Um, we tend to calibrate our online map and our newspaper notice to the general public, our sign notice to the passing public, and our letter notice to the quote unquote kind of impacted public, which is always hard to measure and there's not a perfect number. Um, I did include in the packet the 2020 memo about how we landed on 600 feet because that was a thoughtful and protracted discussion. We calibrated it sort of the size of a Wheat Ridge block. Obviously the larger, well not obviously, we measure the 600 foot radius from the property boundary. So the larger property is the bigger the boundary it's going to capture. The Bank of the West property was also really tiny and it was measured from the Bank of the West property line. So it was a smaller mailing. Um, so in the end, uh, you know, we can't change notice in the middle of a process. You know, if we are starting to hear that feedback, that's just sort of a fundamental piece of um, due process rights that if we have questions on, Mr. Dahl can help respond to, but predictability in the process is important for both the public and the applicant. But here we're in the position of being able to talk about whether or not we wanna make a change now. So we outlined a couple potential scenarios for consideration. Um, we got a comment on Wheat Ridge Speaks with another idea. Um, we can talk about that one too. So I'll run through the couple of options and analysis and um, ideas that we had and you had and the public had and then we'll open it up for discussion. So our first option in the memo responds specifically, Council Member Hulting, to your request of um, expand letter notice for known assemblages. The intent being that if the letter notice uses a larger boundary of a potential assemblage, then you get the benefit of that larger mailing. Um, I did go through the case log to see, does it, like how many other projects have we had this? There's very few other, there's no other exact example. There's, I mentioned in the memo, I think the um, Clear Creek Crossing example. The challenge is determining what is a known assemblage. Um, and you know, in the, in the Bank of the West case, there were different ownerships involved, different phasing of potential future development, so some unknowns. Mr. Dahl gave some thought to sort of how do we articulate a known assemblage since we wrote the memo, so we can share those ideas too. Sure, um, we struggled with that a little bit and I gave it some thought. Um, and as, as Lauren mentioned, predictability is important and a uniformity of a rule, at least a rule you're gonna stick with, is important. You can't say, okay, this project, okay, this is gonna be your rule. You know, it's gotta be in, in the book. And as much as we can, we try to have sort of the similar classes of applications treated similarly. I, I get it, what we're trying to grasp here and embrace here is, well, yeah, but what about projects that are unique in this particular way? Uh, can we de describe them as a class? And certainly you can, you have the right to describe classes of projects and that triggers classes of notice. Um, and, and Lauren and I both gave thought to how we might address the class of large assemblies, uh, assemblages and the two ideas I can think of, and they, they may not be great, but they're what I can think of are, we'd have to do it on the application form. We'd have to say, okay, uh, what other property do you, the applicant, own that is contiguous with this property? You know, because applicants might own property in several places in the city, and that would be too much to say, okay, fine, you know, but if you're trying to get at property they also own that's contiguous that's not a part of the application that they need rezoned or special use permit or whatever, you could ask that question and make that a part of the application. That would be one door. Another door, but what property do you own or under, uh, or what properties are you under contract to purchase to get to the same issue, which I think is probably 
maybe more likely or that feels a little more like the circumstance that we were looking at. There's no perfect way to define large assemblage, but you're going to have to, if you go there, you'll have to define large assemblage because that's a vague term without, you know, a definition. Those are the two that I can, I can think of that are responsive to the concern that was, that was raised. You'd end up with a class that you wouldn't use much. As far as we can tell, we would have used it maybe twice. Uh, but that's my thought for, if you go down that road, how you start to articulate that class. Yeah, and that approach helps because I, I don't like to use discretion where I don't have to. And so if we can make that a more bright line, um, that helps, I think, our staff and our applicants and the public understand what is and isn't going to be a bigger mailing. Um, the second scenario is, is similar to that, uh, the adjacent property under single ownership. I like the idea of the contract to purchase because, frankly, most zone changes are um, under contract contingent on the approval of the zoning. So rarely is it all under one shared ownership. Um, third option is always on the table, which was expand letter, letter notice in general. We've, it's been three years since we went from 300 to 600. Is 600 the right number? There's, again, no magic number. We're probably in the, the middle of the range. The last time we looked at this, folks went up to 1,000 um, feet. So that's certainly an option. I did pull numbers today from our mailings this year. Um, when we added occupants and we went from 300 to 600, we increased our mailings. Uh, this year's 11 projects have ranged from 129 to 699 mailings um, per application. So our average is 250. Biggest variables in there is whether you're adjacent to a multi-unit or apartment um, project. Um, and then, you know, I, we have the comment in Wheatwood Speaks, if you didn't get a chance to see it, it was a thoughtful comment about, you know, why can we use email notice or is a way that I can sort of sign up to be notified of things. And um, I was sharing with Council Member Hoppy before, before the meeting, I don't know how our notify me feature works on the website, um, but there are probably a couple ways we could explore and do a better job of communicating. Is there a way to sign up, say, every time a meeting agenda gets published. It wouldn't be like project specific email lists, but we have technology that we can uh, make sure we're utilizing training and communicating about. Um, you know, we could talk to the software developers of Wheatridge Speaks and say, can you entertain a subscription list so every time a meeting gets published on Wheatridge Speaks that people just get sort of notified there's a meeting coming and then they can self-select if they'd like to comment on those agenda items. So a few different ways to approach this, I think. Um, no, no action is, is always one, so we included that as just a reminder of sort of what are we doing today. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that the last two pages of the packet showed some maps, just to give you a sense what the 600-foot mailing was, I think it's the very last page, the 600-foot buffer for just the Bank of the West piece compared to the um, mailing list we did when the Pet Boys piece was rezoned a couple years ago or maybe a year ago. So you can see that you know, it's not a huge difference, but the east side of that buffer goes a block further when it was against the, the larger parcel. So we're here to answer questions and respond to any ideas that y'all have thought of um, over the last couple weeks as well. Okay, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stites. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Lauren and Jerry, for working on this. Um, you know, I was, I, uh, Councilor Holteen sent me a, a picture from that meeting at the, at the eyes uh, a couple of weeks ago and literally I poked my head in. You can see a picture of my head creepily poking in through the door. Um, but um, it was an interesting meeting. You know, I, I think that we did quite a bit a few years ago to, I mean, literally double the, the, the notice here and um, maybe it's not enough, um, just judging from what we're hearing. And I think, you know, we haven't had a whole lot of rezonings this, well, actually, really, the last four years, but we did have one at 32nd and Wadsworth roughly a couple couple weeks ago or a couple months ago. Um, and I think we we heard from a good chunk of the citizens there, too, that they, they might have wanted more notice as well. So, um, you know, I think rather than going into where, uh, you know, where Jerry was talking about, I mean, it seems like it, that gets really complicated trying to figure out what the assemblage is and all that stuff is. You know, I would just say maybe we go to a thousand feet and, and see what that looks like after that. Um, the, to address the comment from uh, Weaver Speaks, 
would it be possible, and by the way, Lauren, that map that you have, the interactive, that's really cool, and um, I post that on social, people love that. Um, can that have some sort of a notification? Because we have like a notification system for Wheat Ridge Speaks, or for uh, What's Up Wheat Ridge, for each individual project. Could somebody just sign up on that map on that website to get a email notification every time a new yeah. development project is in the works or something like that? I don't know the answer to that. We can certainly ask. Okay. Yeah. Just because that's a website specific to people who want to know about development, so that seems like maybe that might be the place. And then I think our website, the clerk's office, at least one at one point, you could sign up and then the agenda packets would be emailed to you. So um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's still a feature, but hopefully that's still a feature on the website. Uh, clerk, is that, he's giving me a thumbs up. So that's still an option too, so people can still sign up with that. Um, you know, listening to um, our commenters' uh, comments, both at that meeting and, and tonight, you know, I know there's, there's no perfect system. We're not gonna get everybody. Um, and, and I know that there, there are ways that the postal system can give, you know, but that's still gonna take a big chunk out of the budget over if we try to send everybody in Wheat Ridge a letter for every development project, you know, big or small, that's gonna get very expensive, very cumbersome real quickly. So I, I don't think we need to go that far, but I do think by expanding this notice and then giving people more options to get this digitally, I do think that'll help quite a bit. So I'll uh, turn the floor over, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilor Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Lauren, thank you for working on this. I, I do see that the defining the large assemblage is, is sort of like muddy water. Um, I, I agree with we could potentially expand it to 1,000 feet. What I hear is that there's um, a, a cost um, difference in concern, and, and we don't share that currently with the developer. Currently, the city takes that on. And so I would, I would be... A, I would be in agreement with changing it to a thousand feet and splitting that cost with the developers. But I have one quick question though. Like with the Bank of the West property, where it's fronted on two sides mm -hmm. with very wide street frontage, if something like that, ha if we look at our 600 feet and we back out the street frontage, then that would get us another block into the neighborhoods on the other sides of those streets? Would that be something that would be easy to calculate? Um, or would that just make that calculation more difficult? Yeah, that's a good question. So the way that we run the address pull, it's probably gonna be challenging, but I think it could be that increasing the overall radius is a good way to compensate it. Most of our right of ways average 60 feet in width. Um, and certainly the Bank of the West, the WADs to that Upham or Vance block is unique in that it didn't have, it's a super block, that's mm -hmm. what we call it. Um, so I, I think the uh, the GIS tool, w you just draw a, a numeric buffer, so I think it'd be better to increase the buffer than to try to force the map to remove the streets. Than to do the map. Okay. Yeah. All right, so yeah, so with that answer, then I, you know, I, I'm in um, support of, of um, Council Member State's suggestion of increasing it to a thousand feet, I, I would just consider that we perhaps share that cost yep. half half with the developers. Yeah, uh, just sorry, because I if I make point of clarity. Um we charge a flat two hundred dollar fee per public hearing and at the time it was like eh, it's like a little you know, cover some postage, cover the publication costs, cover some of the staff time. And we had said, I think, either formally or informally, when we went from 300 to 600, we'll track the cost to see if this is something we can absorb. Now that we have this good sort of full year of this year and the last couple of years, I think that's a very appropriate response given the current postage costs. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Holteen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks for bringing this forward. Um, I'm gonna touch on a couple of different things. First, I just, really appreciate the community members who are thinking critically on different ways that we can address this. Um, at the meeting that Councilor Ohm and I hosted, it was really clear that it was it was a communication issue as much as anything. And, you know, in, in I know the city was following the letter of the policies that we'd given guidance on. Um, however, the way that played out in the neighborhood just really created, you know, a, a huge disconnection between what was happening and with the complexity of the project. Um, so I don't want to entirely let go of the assemblage idea. I was thinking about this over the weekend and the the two instances actually have been fairly recent 
in the city that are analogous to this? And and I was thinking about you know they're you know everyone's getting getting more clever every year. I, th I hope they are. Um, and you know it could be that acquiring you know a small strip of land could increase the footprint of a project big enough to increase like the allowable density that would change fundamentally the form of of the development. So. I mean, these these feel like one-offs, but you know, small small acquisitions of land fundamentally impact larger things. So, I, I do think some sort of process, if if not in affecting the notifying, at least through this, that it's really clear that a project or a parcel is intended to be part of an assemblage, is important information, even if there has to be you know, it is you know, intended to be, I mean, there can be careful language around that in which we're identifying that there's risk in terms of, you know, ownership and, and you know, there's things that happen after zoning. But I think it's really important that people understand when a property isn't being rezoned with the intention of it just standing alone, but rather being part of that. Um, and secondly, with the, the idea around notifications that are coming up through here, I mean, we, we send a notification to the transcript for publishing our official notice. I mean, we could create an email notification list that receives the same thing we send the Jeffco transcript. Um, so instead of having to do it by the meeting, just <coughs> if, if we're publishing to the transcript notices for hearings, then perhaps we could send an email uh, an email list through <coughs> notifying you. Or it, yeah, and we have that. Um, ability on our website where you can subscribe to pretty much anything that you guys do. <laughs> um, you can get agendas from all of our different boards and commissions, including City Council, Board of Adjustment, Planning Commission. Um, so we have that ability now. People can sign up and get that information. Great. I used to I used to get those emails. Now yeah. I, um, but I think part of that is also communicating how to get that communications. I, I know we layer on there, and and I know the city was for a while taking out ads in the Gazette periodically to remind citizens yep. of ways to stay engaged. And maybe just through those communications, through Mayor's Matters, we're drawing attention to you know if if these issues are important to you. Um, and the notify me page is a little bit, there's so much in it, and so mm -hmm. maybe kind of bundling it a little bit better might be helpful. Um, I do support ex ex the extension to 1,000 feet and splitting the cost with the developer, I think that, or the applicant, I think that, that sounds fair. Um, but it, I am curious, you know, I, I know these are one-offs and we, we, you know, council member Hoppy and I talk about not litigating around like just specific one-off situations, but, um, but I, I think just really the intent of how that property's rezoning is going to play into something larger is is really important because people, you know, I, I kept thinking I would feel really misled by this too, even though that wasn't the intention. So better communications around. You know, this this parcel's not standing alone. Uh, Councilor Weaver. Thank you for this, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I am fine. I, I was for 600 feet, but I would be fine with 1,000 feet, and um, and I like the idea of sharing it with the developer. Um, to what? Uh, uh, Ms. Haltine was was mentioning. I think there are ways that that we can notify, and I know we probably can't connect email addresses with actual addresses uh, because that would be a great way to notify people if we could just um, run the buffer that way uh, in in the in the program. Um, I'm wondering if in the idea of sort of bundling these concepts because I think we run the risk when we increase the radius of, of piecemeal informationing people to death to the point that then there are all these side conversations which we've seen happen in other ways about the public hearing process and, and, um, and I'm wondering if those notifications from the map, which I think that site is brilliant, and I think there's a lot of great ways we could do that. But if we could somehow connect that back to the study session packets, and because we are 
are putting this information out all the time. And of course, we all know what the story is because we've been sitting here and we know that that, that that piece of property was part of a larger thing. And, um, but so that people can go back and they, they can always go back to the whole story. And maybe the whole story is always going back to the six packets that, that where we talked about this so that they're not coming into the public hearing and then saying, I just got this notice and, and we're already a couple months into this. And so I think there's a way we can do that with noticing, especially with the GIS capability and emailing people, um, but even with the actual letter of, hey, we discussed that if things related to this thing on this date, this date, this date, and this mm -hmm. date, all this information is out there. Um, just so they have one place that they can, if they're tracking their neighborhood or whatever, um, they can get the whole picture. Because I, I think what happens is one person hears a thing and then goes and, on social media and posts this thing, and then it becomes this rumor, and then it's this whole conversation. I don't think that happened here. I'm just thinking about other experiences we've had and, and, how, and how we now have a really, really great system that we're, we're connecting the dots with right now. And I just think we have a really great opportunity to do that. So thanks. Uh, thank you. I have uh, Councillor Gozeman and then Councillor Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just so I have a little bit of clarity, I'm, I'm okay with extending it to 1,000 feet. Uh, I was also okay with the 600 feet, but I do want to align the neighborhood meeting letter notice with the public hearing letter notice. So I just want to ensure that those are going to match up when, whatever decision that we end up making. I am glad you asked that because um, we didn't want to come up with too many hypotheticals in the memo, but should you have given us this direction, I was going to request the same. Um, and the other clarification that I'd love to make sure we're, we, I have is that whether or not this is specific to zone changes or any public hearing associated with development. Um, so yes, I would definitely say if we change one, let's change the neighborhood meeting too. And then if you can just affirm, just as a reminder, um, zone changes go to public hearing, specific development plans go to public hearing, special use permits can go to public hearing, some types of subdivisions can go to public hearing. And right now we just have one number that says if you're going to public hearing, no matter who, what you are, that's the number that we use, 600. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, thank you, Councillor Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and I guess I would say when I was thinking about the notice change, my my personal assumption was, was that it would be all public hearings and, and that we would keep it aligned with the neighborhood notices also. Um, so two quick things brought up by uh, Councilwoman Weaver and Halteen. I, I wonder if there, if there is something that we need to consider as far as defining our notification, like putting our notifications maybe in a few different categories, like if there, like to Councilwoman Halteen's point, if there is um, already a, a property that's purchased and um, they're going to pick up another, let's say, you know, lot next to it and it it's going to get rezoned and then it overall changes the density of the entire of the entire project so not like they're re, they're going to rezone it for the intention of increasing the density of their project not just they're going to own that and and we don't know what they're going to do with it for whatever with the intention then then does that maybe trigger a new notice which includes the original notice and notice boundary and information um, in, in that situation. Um, and also the notice having like the historical information attached because yes, I just wanna say that, you know, when, when I know we've seen something and I go looking for it on the website, sometimes it can be difficult to find. Um, the archives can be difficult to navigate sometimes. Um, and, and so, if, if there is something like that that happens, right? So if we're sending out a notice and we're saying uh, this was already rezoned a year and a half ago, they now have, have gotten the opportunity to buy this new lot next to it, they're gonna rezone it, it's gonna become, you know, a purchasing is gonna increase the density. 
here is the historic, here are the links to the archives for the, the historical information. Um, so you can read the memo or watch the meeting and hear the discussion around it. Because I do think that it, it, it helps with some of the conversations with when the rumor mill starts. Um, but, but also, I also understand that there are people in areas that we've sent the notification to that will still come and say to us, because they found out from their neighbor, Mary Schmeri, that this is happening, and they'll say, you didn't tell me. And we can say, we sent that to your address, and here's our proof, right? So that's going to happen always. Like, that's, that is not a narrative we're gonna ever get rid of. But I think that if we can make sure that we're making it as easy as possible, we're not putting the burden on the people to go find the information, we're making it as easy as possible for them to have the correct information. So I, so that's why I just wonder if like, there's kind of a carve out with notice, notices that, that we can maybe do. I wanted to ask a question. You know, I've been seeing a lot lately that uh, using a QR code in order to take you to a site and I don't know that necessarily the QR code, but is that was sort of what we're talking about is that if we give you sort of the basics of an information, a postcard, if you will, but it has, it, it's able to direct you to a site where we've got a summary or, or more case history, as you say, uh, you know, where, where does this project stand from a background, you know, sort of a background idea? Anyway, uh, Councillor Weaver. All those things can be done. Um, in GIS and it's pretty cool and what I should have mentioned before is if you have not been to the Jefferson County Aspen site uh, you can go look up your property and um, and it has all of the historic records linked um, that that could be a very uh, similar thing where the property has you know when you click on the property in sorry I'm I'm looking at a screen in my brain. Um, you would click on the property on a screen and then all of those links would come up about the property, but they could be links to documents that have been happening in the city. Um, and we could put QR codes on those public hearing notices that could then go to that map. And you could track properties and I could sign up to track a property and get notifications when something else had been posted about it. That would be super cool. <laughs> is that good. is that crazy, this unreasonable, cool. illegal? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, th and that is the intent of our projects and properties map, um, that each property, each project will have um, links to all the previous information. They're not all populate it yet, but I'm just looking at one right now. You could go back to the, the We Rick Speaks page that's got the, the video presentation from staff, it's got the staff report, um, so that's our project map. We'll, we'll do that. I don't think they're all, I don't think every property's populated yet with all the information, but we're still working on that. And, and we could link city council meetings to that too, and the packet yeah. and things. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stites. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And you know, I kind of think of it like, for a lot of people, this is a serialized TV show, right? And and for a lot of people, they're jumping in at like season seven, episode six, and <laughs> like without a recap of what happened for the previous you know seven seasons. So um, you know, I think that having those links or having a you know, QR code or whatever, I think that's great. Um, I think we're still going to hear from people. Well, what if I don't want to use technology? What if I don't? What if I you know? But it, you know, at some point, if you care, you have to care enough to care, right? You have to care enough to do a little research on your own, and, and you know, I know that that's not the most popular thing to hear, I guess, but, like, you know, at some point, if we're sending out the notices, you know, you know what channel your favorite TV show is on, and if you want to watch it, you either subscribe to that channel or you don't, right? So, you know, when I wanted to watch Game of Thrones, I had to get HBO, right? You know, if I didn't, then, you know, I just had to hear the summaries or something, you know? So, that's that's how it is, you know, you, you know where we are, we're here every Monday, you know where the, you can get all the notifications, so we just need to make sure that we're sending that stuff out, I think. Um, I would, you know, and as, as we think about the assemblies, you know, anybody who is gonna wanna do a bigger project over the next few years in Wheat Ridge, 
they're going to have to assemble a bunch of smaller properties together, right? Because you're not going to go buy a, a big property at this point, so you're going to have to assemble. So I think that might become more of a more than a, just a one-off thing. I think it might become the future of anybody wanting to build bigger, bigger stuff. So um, having a classification like uh, Councilor Hoppy said, to where they're if they are trying to assemble those those properties that it is sent out to the original people, I think that's maybe a good idea to go as well. So if we um, I do think that we should uh, continue the 1,000 feet for all um, uh, public hearings. hearings as well. Public hearings. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Holtine. Thank you. I have a somewhat uh, sort of sidebar question. How, how long typically is, like, what's the standard for us to have a first reading, and how far out is that? second is the actual hearing like what's our what's our standard time <coughs> the gap in time between the first and second reading um, it has to be more than two weeks so you most often see them four weeks apart okay and th so that's t like kind of the standard yeah our pending, standard is like pending three where city council meetings exactly fall. It's three to four weeks like we have a spreadsheet it's like 18 to 25 days depending on holidays or something like that yeah. okay um, yeah, I just I kind of wanted just to check our process against like reasonable mm -hmm. time frame for people to you know get information, digest yeah. it, do their research, ask the questions. The it's a good question. So the that gap in time is informed because the code requires a 15 day comment period, and we can't start that clock until you officially set the hearing date. So you can't go from Monday first reading two weeks later. It'd be 14 days. So um, there's almost always three to five weeks, depending on holiday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to see if I could um, ask for a consensus to move forward with changing our radius to a thousand feet, sharing the cost of that with the developers, and um, having it for both public notices and neighborhood meetings. It looks like we have consensus on that. And then I would like to ask if um, anyone, if uh, we could have a consensus to have staff bring us back a little more information now that we've discussed more thoroughly our expectations of what we would like to see in, in advancement and how our notices look, and just see if staff can bring that back to us in the future. Sounds like we want to move forward on that also. Do you yeah. want that? You understand that? Consensus. Yes, I one. do. Okay. Yeah, the, um, and if I can maybe just opine on it, I think I think we can do a better job of telling the story. Like we write the history in the staff report. Like there's, we write that history the day we pre-app with somebody. So we have that story to tell, and we can put that in the letter. We've been using a template. We've been trying to make the template less, no offense, legal easy. <laughs> um, but there's more story that can be included in there, which can include QR codes or links so people can, who really want to dig in, like Bank of the West, we could have told the story of the WAS rezoning and then the Pep Boys rezoning and then the discussion on the sale. That all could have been there up front. So I think that's a great idea. Um, our GIS, like, uh, you're right, there's a lot of potential. We're about to change over some staff there. So that sort of building the GIS map will have to take a little bit more time. The other thing I'm optimistic about is um, our new ERP, we we use that software to track permits and land use cases, um, and there's the potential that it can have a public-facing portal. So you could, to your point, you could um, go to a record and see sort of all the activity, permits, zone changes, subdivisions that's associated with the parcel. So I think if we have near term, tell the story better in the letter, make those um, packets more easily findable, and then uh, sort of next year, probably ERP stuff and in GIS. So I think I think it all makes sense. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Terrific, Councilor Holteen. Uh, I'd like to ask for a consensus that we uh, include uh, inquiring about tracking and communicating intentions around assemblages as part of that process. And so that is included in the application. And then as that storytelling and all that communication is that any, any potential assemblage is communicated within that, recognizing there's a risk. Okay. All right. You okay. Are you good with that? Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with understanding, you know, you ask people, what are your intentions? And they can tell you at this point, no. 
because that's the truth for them. And that can change later. And unless we have a, okay, you have to tell us your intentions today, tomorrow, the day after the hearing, I'm not trying to be pejorative, but you see what I'm articulating, which is you can certainly say, tell us what your intentions are, tell us what property you own, and we'll make that a part of the public facing information we present. But um, uh, it, that's a snapshot. Uh, and unless you require more snapshots or a moving picture, uh, you know, you'll get a snapshot. And, and that may not remain, I think we have to understand that just people change, the business needs change and it will evolve. Uh, and you say there are limitations, I'm taking way too long to say, there are limitations on the, the accuracy of the information that, that you'll get, especially as time goes on. But you'll get information that you don't have now. Councilor Hilteen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Dahl. And I appreciate that. I realize it's it's a snapshot, but we're not asking the question. And then the way that information is communicated is pretty haphazard. At what point anybody knows or doesn't know that it is or is not. Um, so at least if we're asking at some point in the application and communicating what we know when we ask, then we have a point of origin of our understanding of the situation. And that's, I think, important to communicate. And I think we, uh, staff will do a great job of developing sort of the, the boundaries around that and how to communicate that clearly and that this is by no means certainty and there's risk all over at this, but this is what we know now. Thank you. Councilor Weaver. To both of those points, I also think that in this communication that we should be very explicit that things do change and that that's a right by owner within the rules of you know, sometimes we're talking about a planned, sorry, I'm not gonna remember the words, where it's uh, the, the pre-plan oh. before the actual plan, and it's, it's what they think where buildings might go, and they think what the facades might be, or what the, the heights might be, but that's not what we're talking about yet, because it's the plan before that, and so, inserting that in the story too as well because I know we've sat here and had people say that's not what they said they were going to do in the meeting at the the planning what's it called the no there's a, a document before the actual document it's the site area the site plan yeah no the site plan. Conce conceptual site plan pre apps neighborhood meetings concept plans concept plan. planned the outline development plan. It's the outline development plan. There we go. Which is not the very, the specific yeah. stuff. Yeah. And the ODP, thanks. Yep. Um, so I just want us to be aware that I think people also get caught up in that in hearing somebody say, well, you said you were gonna do this, or you said it was gonna be priced this way, or you said, and, and I just think we have to be, let people know that there are, there are things that get to change because of use by right. But we also look at these hearings um, under a certain format of information that we're, we're judging these projects against. And, and do we go, do we tread into, into muddy waters if, we, if an expectation that we have of a project is not part of the, of the technical requirements that we're viewing the project in? I mean, it's one thing if we have discretion, you know, to, to evaluate that idea but are we, are we moving into an area that that's not part of the criteria that we use with which to judge these projects? In which case, you know, that could, uh, that could color uh, the way an applicant looks at it or, or, uh, or color our judgment if that is something that we shouldn't have the, that's not proper for us to influence. I guess that's just the other side of the argument, so. Yeah, um, the, you raise a good, point under the code there's a list of things that the council considers and can only and are the things you consider what's being described I think is uh, beyond that whether and to what degree we we inform the public about the penumbra if I can you know there's the stuff in the code and there's the you know there's the okay th this is the surrounding context that we want you to know about um, in the end I'm thinking out loud here because it's kind of a new concept, but in the end, 
the council's decision will have to get uh, judged based upon what's what's in the code. The the risk you run isn't so much a legal one as it is a, uh, a per, one of perception and of expectation of the public. Well, you told me all this stuff. How come? And so I'm not saying that means you don't tell people stuff. What I am saying, I guess, and you've all recognized it in your comments one way or another, what I'm saying is that as you tell people that, you'll need to make that clear, that this is context. The council's role is somewhat more limited. Uh, so it's you'll just need to, as you're messaging it, you don't want to raise expectations that that aren't true in the in the code book. Uh, it's you know the, the consensus is what it is, and I would I would think that probably it's Lauren and my task now to sit down and say, okay, let's take some real examples, and how would we message that in a way that gives people the context, but does not uh, provide expectations that can't be uh, fulfilled. And, and sitting here today, I, I'm, I'm going to be better armed to answer that after we've looked, I think, at some examples. But the mayor's point is a good one, I think. I, I think you see some of that language, like, in this, again, in the staff report, probably too late in the game. Like, we're rezoning this to mixed use. The applicant intends to build multifamily. And you should be aware that every other permitted use in mixed use would be allowed should they decide not to build multifamily. So we're always trying. And it's why some applicants are not as forthcoming, because they know that they don't need to be for the criteria. Mm -hmm. Um, but we can we can tell that story that comes in the staff report buried in dozens of pages of analysis. We can tell that in the neighborhood meeting letter and just sort of educate people earlier. I think, yeah. It's somewhat akin to the to the discussion we had not long ago about uh, granting more administrative mm -hmm. uh, approval process because we don't really have discretion in the matter. So it's just following along that way, and I just think we ought to be. Any further further discussion on item number one? Pretty pretty good discussion. Okay, thank you, Lauren. It's a great report. Um, and Mr. Dahl. Um, <laughs> Thanks, we will move to our second agenda item. This is the appointment process for the presiding judge. Mr. Dahl. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so you, you all received an email from, or a letter, I think, from Judge Randall um, a few weeks ago, as you know, the city's current presiding judge, Chris Randall, is retiring, effective um, at the end of this year, um, after 22 years of service here at Wheat Ridge. Uh, per the city's code of, code of laws, the mayor um, has the authority to appoint a substitute judge, and he has done that. He has appointed Judge Paul Basso, and he is here in the audience. If you haven't met him, Paul. Um, Paul, um, so that appointment will be until um, the City Council makes the permanent appointment, which we um, are asking for a direction on this evening. Um, Judge Basso has frequently serves uh, Wheat Ridge as a, as a relief judge and an administrative hearing officer um, for, and, and you, his resume was uh, included in your packet for, for your, your information. But Judge Basso is, has expressed interest in, um, first of all, the, the uh, substitute judge position, but also um, the uh, permanent presiding judge position. So um, uh, under the Wheat Ridge City Charter, the municipal judge uh, serves a two-year term and is appointed by you all. Um, if you remember, um, we just reappointed Judge Randall this last year, August sometime. Um, the charter requires that the judge be a member of the bar um, of the state of Colorado, have a minimum of five years experience um, on the bench or in active practice of law in Colorado. Um, the charter and code lay out the other duties of the judge, which um, were summarized in your packet. I won't go over those unless you have any questions. Um, staff conducted some research um, on the structure and staffing of municipal courts in Colorado, again, which was in your packet. Um, they're essentially two court structures, one of a, an administrative management model, which removes the administrative responsibilities from the presiding judge and assigns them to a court manager or court, court administrator, as Kirsten is here. Kirsten, I'm sorry, Armstrong, do you know everybody? <laughs> Kirsten Armstrong is our court administrator, um, and she's been here even longer. How long have you been here, Kirsten? 33 years. Um, and the other model is, is the... Um, is a judicial management model where the presiding judge is responsible for managing both the administrative duties of the court 
um, and also the judicial functions of the court. This is the current model we use in Wheat Ridge. Um, majority of cities that we did interview um, uh, do operate under the administrative uh, management model, which is different um, than what Wheat Ridge does. Um, so with that background, staff is looking for some direction from city council on three specific items. Um, first of all, um, administrative versus uh, judicial management structures. As I mentioned, um, we could, first of all, the one, one option is to continue with the current um, staffing structure. In this scenario, the presiding judge acts as the department director, as Judge Randall has. Um, and directly manages the staff. Or we could mitigate, migrate to the administrative model, again, where council could assign the hiring and personnel management activities to a court administrator, such as Kirsten, um, who works under the direction of, of city management in um, a deputy city manager, or city manager, or, or another um, area in the city. Um, so that is um, two options. We do, staff does recommend this second option. We can talk about that more. Um, the recruitment of a presiding judge, we're asking, looking for some um, direction on that too. Um, a couple different options are to direct staff to do a widely distributed RFP or just a job posting, um, as a lot of cities have done, to find interested candidates for the role of presiding judge. Um, you could just have an interview with Judge Basso, who again, who expressed interest and see if um, he would, uh, be the person you would like to appoint. Um, we do recommend, since it has been 22 years since we've had a judge, we, we, we recommend that we do a, uh, at least a recruitment and, um, and ask uh, Judge Basso to also apply um, along with any other interested candidates. The third area we're looking for is, is how these, um, these applicants are reviewed. Um, a couple different options here are for city council as a body to review all the applicants and conduct interviews on as many as you'd want. Um, secondly, to establish maybe some type of search committee involved with maybe a few of the city council, some staff, maybe even some community members, maybe somebody from the Race and Equity T Task Force um, who would provide a list of finalists for city council to, um, to consider, and that's, that's the option we recommend, or direct staff to review applications and provide a finalist list to city council. So those are three areas that we're looking for some direction tonight, but um, Mr. Dahl is here um, to help answer any questions, and as I mentioned, Kirsten Armstrong, and um, love to uh, have a discussion about this. Okay. Raise your hand, Councillor Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Judge Basso, for filling in the empty seat for us. So we have the opportunity to consider our options. Um, yeah, so after reading through the, um, the memo and looking at like the different comparisons against regional cities, I, I think that, that we really should migrate to administrative management model. Also in part that we're really trying to get some of our more positions in our, in our city staff that are city staff positions like the deputy city clerk, but, but not actually city staff positions. Um, we're trying to get those more integrated and, and so that it's a, it's the same playing field for everybody. Um, so I think the administrative model is definitely the way to go with that. Um, <clears throat> I think an RFP would be great. Uh, I think that, you know, it's been so long since we've been in this swimming pool that maybe we should, or this pond, maybe we should check out the fish. Um, and, um, I think establishing a, a search committee that is that has community members on it is absolutely amazing opportunity for us to take, um, and you know, uh, elected officials and, and staff and whatnot. But to be able to include our community into this decision, especially because we don't vote on a judge, which it looks like there's one community that votes on a judge. So, I, I think this is a great option for us to bring into our community and and what an opportunity so that's those are kind of my positions and where we are Councilor Hultin thank you mr. mayor I mostly agree with uh, what miss Hoppy just said I uh, you know this is we haven't had this opportunity in a long time I really appreciate staff like thoroughly looking at what the options are and what are best practices um, I agree actually for a lot of the same reasons miss Hoppy said that we uh, moved to the 
uh, administrative model. I think that that is aligning with generally what we're trying to accomplish in the city and would be also the best use of uh, our, our new judges' time. Um, I want to kind of smish together the other two consensuses. I really strongly believe that the, the committee representative of you know staff, elected officials, and as Ms. Hoppe said, community members specifically would love to see the idea community members as well as um, some of the police advisory um, in there to you know just provide like a really well-informed uh, decision. But it, it would be really great if we could actually, here you call it a search committee and it's actually a selection committee under review committee. Um, it would be really great if it was a search and selection committee and that maybe they could help inform the RFP um, when we were doing our police chief search, that was a really thoughtful, iterative process that involved the community, even in what were the criteria and um, qualifications that were important for the candidate. And it has translated into a fantastic police chief for our city. So if we're gonna uh, convene that committee, I would highly recommend we convene it to also help um, advise on the RFP and how the uh, search is conducted in such a way that we are getting the kind of candidates that we really want to say um, serving our city because our judge makes really important decisions that affects the lives of a lot of our neighbors and um, so I I would love to to create that committee and have that committee uh, advise on the RFP I would like to see an RFP and then have that same committee uh, review the applicants and um, present the their finalists or finalists to the council thank you council Weaver um, I agree with all of the staff recommendations with the inclusion of what uh, Councillor Holteen just said. And I also just wanted to uh, thank Judge Bacco for his work here. And, um, and it's, always, it's always fun to read a colleague's resume. So thanks for all these cool things that you've been doing with the city of Wheat Ridge and of course before that as well. Um, but it's always nice to, to get to know somebody in their background. So thanks so much. Thank you. Um, are our, um, have we uh, been to the market to see if our compensation package is competitive in this, uh, for this position? We did. We didn't look at it um, at this last reappointment of Judge Randall, but we did the previous time. Um, we provided that information to City Council, and that's something we, we need to do okay. with um, this process also. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but at least the last go around, we were um, definitely competitive. Um, okay. All right, further discussion. Uh, Councilor Stites. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. I, I agree with the recommendations uh, Councilor Holtine and Councilor Hoppe uh, put forward. I just, again, I wanted to thank uh, Judge Basso and I, I wanted to thank Judge Randall um, for, for uh, years and years of service, uh, 2002. So he was, he was appointed as judge about a year before my dad was appointed to council. So that's, um, and they served together for a long time. So um, Judge Randall's fantastic. So I really appreciate all of his time and effort over the last 21 years. That's been heck of. So um, thank you and thank you for uh, the recommendations made. And for her inaugural uh, comment, I'd like to go to uh, Councillor Snell. Do, do, do. Um, <laughs> thank you. And I just a couple of quick questions on this. I do agree very much with the, with the um, forming a committee, a search committee, that's a wonderful idea, especially including the um, Race and Equity Task Force idea committee members. Uh, can you give me, or is there, wh how, what was the timeline for the police chief, police chief search? And does that timeline kind of translate to the same for the judge? Yeah, we, um, geez, that's just been a couple of years ago. You think I remember, right? But um, it was right before COVID, so I forgot everything after COVID. Um, it was a good, it was a good six or seven months, I believe. Um, uh, I, yeah, I remember going out the day after Christmas to interview him in, in Prince George's County. Um, I can't remember when we started, but we hired a professional recruitment firm for that. Um, that's an option here, or we could have HR manage it also, or purchasing. We have examples of RFPs that other communities used. I think if we did it ourselves, it'd probably be a little bit shorter time frame. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking it's probably a good four to six months probably still for a process, especially if you're involving a community uh, uh, community members on, I think we want to make sure we give everybody enough time. Councilor Dozman. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and thank you for bringing this forward. And I would also like to say goodbye and and uh, thank Judge Randall for his time here on the um, serving as judge. And I've had the opportunity to to talk with him, and and um, he's wonderful. And I really appreciate all of the questions that he asks when he um, comes to. to either present to council or sit in on any of the legislative updates, you know, as, as we were in COVID or coming out of COVID mm -hmm. and um, addressing the social justice movement. I really appreciated his insight and I think he's served our community very well. Um, and I also wanna thank uh, Judge Basso for sitting in and um, in the interim and uh, I, I hope you do apply because I, I, I believe it would be good um, and to, to put out an RFP um, and can you maybe explain a little bit about the nuances between the administrative um, and current makeup? Because like I, I read in the memo that it just, it comes down to the judge just doing the, the judicial duties, correct? And then somebody else doing more of the administrative. So would that just be like the paperwork and filing? Yeah, I'll start, and maybe Kristen, you want to add, and, and, and Jerry. Um, so currently, Judge Randall has um, worked into um, a, a bigger role here at the community than most judges do. Um, he um, considers himself a department director, so he comes to the management team um, meetings with the rest of the department directors, police chief, community development director, um, alley, and such. Um, and you know, with that structure, he 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 um, he manages um, supervises staff. Um, but then we do have Kirsten; <laughs> she may tell you something different. Um, actually, how it works. Uh, um, nothing against Judge Randall or anybody, but um, Kirsten is the the court manager, so she. I think you know most staff falls under her, but I think um, maybe I'll let her speak to maybe how it's working today. What we're suggesting is that. Um, I think it's, it potentially could be difficult to find a judge today that wants to come on and take on the, those duties. Um, a lot of judges are, um, are, they have a lot of practice or they're doing other work. Um, they, the judge today is, is 30 hours, um, um, but that does include his department director work. So I don't know if, uh, if, uh, if we bring a, a judge on would need those many hours to do just the, the court work. Um, so, Kristen, did you want to add anything to that or um, on kind of what the current structure is? Uh, no, but I do agree with um, Patrick that um, a lot of judges would not want to do the administrative piece of the, the position. Um, it's easier managed uh, through my position, and then I would be reporting to, I'm assuming, um, city management. Um, so you would not have an employee of the city reporting to a contract appointed position. Um, so that kind of falls in line with where the city would like that structure to be. That was one of the reasons for the recommendation. Um, so it, we would still, all of the staff would still take direction from the judge because there would be legal implications that we would need to follow. Um, they would need to give us some direction in that. So it, it's not like they wouldn't do any of that. It would just be that the majority of the administrative stuff would be handled um, through me. And, and so if we move to the administrative structure, would it be a matter of the, the judge still serving in a capacity in which, you, like a leadership role where they would, um, you know, either advise city staff or, or kind of be a department head and still be a part of those other kind of internal meetings? Likely not. Again, okay. I don't think um, most judges want that role. I think Judge Randall um, likes that part of it, and, and we, we kind of adjusted his contract over the years to, to give him those additional roles. But um, I think Kirsten has probably more experience with this with judges that, um, again, most of them I think are on a contract. They, they have other... Um, they work in other courts sometimes. They have a law practice that they're working on. Um, you know, maybe we could find somebody that would do this, but I think we're gonna have a better chance finding somebody that just wants to come in, be the judge. They wouldn't be coming to management team meetings. Um, of course, you know, they would come to any meeting that we might need them at. Um, they probably have meetings with court staff and such, but um, all most of that personnel management um, and those types of things would be handled between court administrator and, and probably somebody in the city manager's office. 
So I think one of the things that Judge Randall did very well was um, being really connected to our community. And I think serving in that capacity allowed him to, to be really connected. Mm -hmm. um, and so my concern would be kind of a, um, you know, just, just a service and, uh, you know, connection to the community if, if somebody no longer served in that role or that capacity, like they would come in and they would just preside. They wouldn't necessarily be a part of, you know, city staff and, and the community. And actually, I, I do think that they would still have that role. Um, you're just taking away the um, more administrative, supervisory, those types of aspects of their position that Judge Randall's handling now. Um, so I think they would still have that ability to connect with the community, um, connect with staff in various different ways. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dahl. Um, if I could just add, I <clears throat> absolutely agree with Kirsten about the, you know, the structure of, a, of a city staff than reporting to a contract individual from just a pure chain of command em employee, you know, discipline kind of standpoint. And I really think that it does need to be within the city or should be. Um, in my experience for other cities, th the, the judge's role is uh, one where uh, they typically are not administrators. Um, you go to law school and you practice law, that doesn't mean you also have an administrative uh, degree. Uh, sometimes you end up having to develop one, but it's not, I guess the point I, I would make would be, the, it's, it's not something that judges uh, necessarily expect to do or want to do. And the other point I guess I'd make, we've been so fortunate to have Judge Randall for so long, uh, but these appointments for two years, and I would hope that the next appointment is for as long, don't get me wrong, but it, I think it's important to design the structure uh, with that in mind because judges can change and I wouldn't design the structure because of a, of a human being, uh, no matter how um, effective that person's been you know, in the, in the job. I agree with Kirsten too that, that it's absolutely part of the judicial code of ethics and, and attorney's code of ethics to outreach to the community. That's not something that you need an administrative role to do. That's something you believe in really strongly. I do, I do training and we all, as lawyers, you, you do that because not only should you ethically, but honestly, you enjoy doing that. I really enjoy trying to make the law um, understandable to people, not only just my clients, but, but the people I, I interact with generally. So if that's a concern, I think I can, I, I can assure you that that role, any judge will consider something that just ethically and personally, morally, they, they want to continue to do. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hoppy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask for a consensus to uh, mitigate. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Rachel. Councillor Hultine. Thank you. Um, so, Judge Randall was at the CML conference, uh, not this year, but the past year. And we were all together in one of the receptions. And I just, you know, I have thought highly of him forever, but he is so well regarded by his peers and really through, you know, being able to talk with Judge Randall while he was talking with other municipal judges and just really understanding, you know, his, his, you know, his leadership and his, you know, thoughtful approach to his work here and how he has not just done well with our community, but made other municipalities better for it as well. And um, in listening to Ms. Dozman's question, I do wonder, you know, taking the judge out of the executive management meetings, um, I'm sure in those meetings he was really getting a sense of like, what are the things in the community that we are dealing with as a whole? And, and so I'm just sort of curious if we shift to this administrative structure, like what would, where, like where would be the role of the judge in terms of communicating with senior city leadership and tracking what's going on in the city and the nuances of that. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, prior to Judge Randall, uh, we had Judge Davis and he was here for, I, I think, like 10 years. Um, and um, so how the structure worked then is I attended the meetings and that. 
Um, but I always kept him very informed. Um, he was before council uh, for budget meetings, um, for other things that maybe if he was um, doing something different like a new program or um, fines and fee increases. So even he was before council a minimum of two or three times a year. Um, but he just didn't attend the EMT meetings. But again, he was very well in, informed of what's going on with the city, um, had a great connection with um, the city manager. So we could always structure it that, that I don't want to get the opinion that they're not gonna have anything to do with the rest of the city because that would not, not be accurate, if that's, if that's helpful. That is helpful. I think it's just important that that communication, and I was assuming it would happen. It was just good to know how, how that happens. Okay. Yeah, it, it, and that position works for you guys, not me. So I think um, there, you know, I think I would like to increase some communication with, between that position and council. And, and there, there's numerous times where when Judge Randall's in a management team meeting with us, we have to ask him to leave because you can imagine a judge needs to stay very neutral and unbiased to a lot of things and a lot of things we talk about in in management team meetings are are cases that may come in front of him um and he has to leave um quite often honestly um so uh it's you know it's he does definitely have a different role than the management team um because he needs to keep a neutral um position on on things thanks they actually kind of led to the second part of it was i you know don and me i he hasn't come in front of us very much in the time that i've been on here uh, maybe he did a little bit more before, and so I think maybe as a council, us looking a little bit more closely at, you know, how are we engaging this, you know, our, our new judge in, in our policies and calling forth for, for policy things and inviting the judge to come to us with, with some frequency. So I, uh, moving forward, it would be great for us to be keeping that under consideration. Thanks. Uh, Councilor Hoppe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like ask to ask for consensus to migrate to an administrative management model with our judicial system, or our judge system, and um, that we <clears throat> create a search and select and advise, sorry, advise search and select committee that will advise on the RFP, and then will also be a part of um, find, finding us the finalist lists, which include elected officials, staff, community members, to council for final consideration. Looks like we have consensus on that, unanimous, to move that uh, forward with proposal forward. Yep, that's all we need, thank okay. you, appreciate any it. Other, any other things on that item? All right, well thank you very much for coming, hope you have a great Thanksgiving. And uh, that will conclude item number two. Uh, I think we now go to, uh, uh, thanks Kirsten, mm -hmm. Judge Basso. Staff reports. Good to see you. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, yeah, quick, a couple things from me. Um, I'd like to uh, kind of regroup and debrief about last Monday's meeting just a little bit. Um, and uh, we've been thinking about it uh, a lot with, with staff and Mr. Dahl and um, um, Rachel and I were just at the National League of Cities Conference and um, talked to some of our peers there on, on what they're doing with public meetings and public comment. Um, and we're kind of looking for some direction this evening on, on if you want to make any um, immediate changes for next week's meeting um, that could be temporary until we figure, um, do more research or they could be permanent too. But um, as the tradition is with three doors, um, we have three doors this evening. Um, we could do nothing right now, just continue with what we've been doing. Um, you know, and I, I just want to back up a little bit. I don't, you know, I think you all agree. We don't want to make, we don't want to overreact. We don't want to make any knee-jerk reactions, I, th I believe, to what happened Monday. I don't believe it's probably going to happen again here in Wheat Ridge. You may have been seeing more and more news. It's, it is happening across the country. Um, there were two other cities in Colorado, I believe, that were um, hit after us um, in the last couple of weeks. But um, I think there's a few things we may want to consider doing. Again, we could do nothing, just continue moving forward. Um, one thing we heard from a lot of our peers is they require, this would be a second option, require a pre-registration on Zoom. If you're going to, if you want to make public comment through Zoom on a, at a council meeting, you have to register by a certain time, um, the day, that day of the meeting. Um, so we have a list, we could have them, they could even, you could even ask them to um, tell us what the topic is, if they're a resident or not. Um, we don't have necessarily have to ask for a full address, I don't think. Um, 
So that's an option. Um, a third option would be to um, not allow public comment through Zoom, still have Zoom meetings, but um, use our We Urge Speaks as the official place to make comments. They would be written comments in advance, and you would see those before the meeting, but um, that could be an option too, um, and, and stop the uh, public um, comments uh, through Zoom at the, at the meetings. So those are three different things we, we, we were looking at. Um, we're doing other research as we, as we continue moving forward, but um, those are a couple things that we could do immediately if you, if you want to for the next meeting. Councilor Weaver. Thanks. Um, I like the second option. I like the registration. I, I do think it's a nice option to offer people uh, in Wheat Ridge who can't come to a meeting um, or who are just getting home from work. Uh, that is a hard thing on people. Uh, but I think registering, if they want to come say something on Zoom, I think that's a totally fair option. So that's what I would like to go towards. Councilor Dozman. Thank you. I, I like the uh, pre-registration option, but I also wanted to know if there could be potentially be a requirement for video if they're if they're if they're coming in on the Zoom. But I know we also take calls, so I don't know how necessarily that would work. Some city we've heard that I think from a city or two that they're requiring video. But you're right that we would get a phone call in. Um, um, I, you know, some people could say, "Well, damn, I'm not working, so we may not get them get them on anyway." I don't know something we could require, but I know some cities And I think you, you, in the main, you want to remain inclusive. You know, that was the theme really of earlier, your first agenda item. And I agree about the not uh, overreacting. There's a balance here that it can be uh, achieved. And I know that there are members of the Wheat Ridge community that are not that computer literate, right? That has come up many times over the over years and people have said that's why we still need newspaper notices why we still need mail notices so those are the people with just telephones um i will say that that you know i put a message out on the attorneys listserv the municipal attorneys listserv and got at least a dozen really supportive responses with some you know everybody stepped to the plate i was really proud of the, my peers around the around the state and i've been assembling a rather long list of the things that were suggested. They fall into similar categories, and I expected many of them. But um, the, the ones that are mentioned are were, were main themes, you know, limiting the amount of time, limiting uh, many communities say, okay, we're going to do that at the end of the meeting. So you're going to have to wait, and you're not quite sure when you're going to get your public comment, but we'll do it at the end of the meeting. Or saying we'll do it at the beginning of the meeting for X minutes, and then either we're done or you're welcome to log in at the end. And lots of what I'm expressing is sort of a huge bunch of sort of mix and match techniques. Uh, registration, I think, is a good idea, is a really good idea. Um, in part, this will affect what your council rules say, and you'll need to actually change them. So you might consider, we can certainly, and I don't mean to, to um, could we, um, could we speak to the video piece first before yeah, sure, we go yeah, on? Yeah, Allie, okay. Allie wants to speak to because it's a very okay. good question and I forgot. There's a very good reason we don't allow video. Allie? Okay, yeah. Allie, would you like to? Hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person tonight. Um, regarding your question, Councillor Dozeman, it's really interesting. At the, I don't know if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, um, the communities that were Zoom bombed, um, it was nudity and profanity on signage and i'm really proud of the fact that we um we we, we set our um our zoom program up as webinar from the beginning because it allows us to control what's on camera and so i i just wanted to send a quick reminder about some of the lewd things that happened um on hoa and um and city um meetings at that time so i i would i would not recommend um camera i think well on the one hand, it might offer some accountability. On the other, I think it could actually um, be a little bit more challenging um, to manage. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hoppy. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, so with the pre-register, how far in advance could somebody register? Because it, if, it's, if it's something where they can register on more than just Monday, then I, then I yeah. think that that would be fair. 
Because if we're going to say you have to pre-register by a certain amount of time, right? Like we cut off what you would speaks by noon. And so if we say you have to pre-register by a certain time and it's only available from Monday at, at uh, 8 a.m. until, you know, 5 p.m., well, somebody might not be able to get, you know, they may be working or something. Yep. So what, what are we thinking? What are the time limits around being able to pre-register? We would recommend it be aligned with We Rich Speaks comments. Okay. Um, so as soon as the packet is, is out on Thursday, you can you can register, and then probably you know I, we'd probably recommend up to noon on Monday because that's when we cut off um, Wayward Speaks comments too. To okay. Keep it aligned. Um, so you know I I there were some people that got a hold of me and, and said you know well I think that why are we even doing Zoom public comment anymore? And I would just say that we overwhelmingly get more positive interaction and feedback with our Zoom comments, and so I definitely want to maintain that. Um, the pre-register with the Zoom, it, I'm, I'm okay with that, you know, as long as we have enough time, so Thursday to Monday at noon is, is good. As, as far as changing our council rules, I wonder if this is something, I'm just interested to know if this is something everybody wants to do forever, and we change our council rules, or is this something we want to do temporary and, and I guess I would say if our city attorney is going to come back to us with an, a different list of options, so maybe we should consider it temporary currently and, um, and we can utilize the suspend the section 7A, suspend our rules to be able to, to do the pre-register on Zoom and then when we have a more solid plan then we can move forward or we could change our council rules and then go back and change our council rules again. So. To something to think about. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stites and I have uh, Councillor Holteen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I actually had the same exact question as, as Councillor Hobby, but I was going to actually ask it for a different reason. I was going to ask if we could push the registration up until maybe even six o'clock before the meeting because some people who are going to use Zoom are going to be, well, I was going to go to the meeting, but I got stuck at work and so I can Zoom in or something from from the road so if they can register up until maybe like 6 p.m. or something the day of um, we still have all the information they're still gonna do their public comment I you know I don't know what the benefit I guess for us is if we have that six hours in advance I mean I know why we, why it's a, a benefit when it's a written comment but I'm not sure that we have a benefit when it's gonna be somebody who's gonna get on zoom anyway um, so um, I would I would actually push it up until about 6 p.m. Um, on that, but uh, I, I agree that uh, um, going to some sort of registration system. But I also think temporarily, um, I don't I don't think that uh, um, we need to knee jerk overreact to anything at the moment. I think that for and I was talking to Ali I think about this uh, last week. There's been hundreds of meetings that we've held via Zoom, via you know council meetings, planning meetings, you know, uh, public meetings, different things like that, and this is the first issue we've had. Um, so I think that we should just kind of stay the course, add the registrations for certainly next week and, and maybe temporarily moving forward, but I don't think that we need to uh, make any uh, permanent uh, changes at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councilor Holteen. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think about all of these as kind of, an, how do we make them as analogous as possible? Um, the intent of Zoom is to open up accessibility, the civic voice for people to be able to join us when they would otherwise not be able to. And so I, I agree with council member, Mayor Pro Tem Stites, you're still council member Stites though too, man. You're all the Stites. Um, that you know, cutting, cutting not, I mean, I would be fine if it was even just at you know, same time we pull the sheet that we then, if you if you aren't in line with your hand raised, like that's it. With the intent being that we, what we're doing with this consideration is is saying there might be times when we have a hundred people. Let's just be crazy for a minute, but like we have an extraordinary number of people who want to give comment, whether they are mysterious people from across the country or people within our own community and knowing how many people want to give comment at the beginning of comment would allow the mayor to you know say we're going to 
do 45 minutes worth of comment and anyone else is welcome to provide comment at the end. I mean, it's, it's a matter of like administering the, the meeting to be, um, you know, give consideration so that we can conduct our business. And, um, and so I, I also want to give the same consideration to people signing in and giving comment in person. If we're gonna create those restrictions around virtual comment, then I think having the same consideration for, for in person. And, it, and I struggle with that a little bit because I, more than one famous story from watching Channel 8 at my house, getting worked up, getting in my car, driving over here and like giving my, my comment. And that's, I think, one of the things I loved about Wheat Ridge. Um, and I think those were actually both for public hearings and not public's right to speak at the beginning. But I just, I, I wanna try and keep the online and in-person as analogous as, as possible so that we're managing, you know, giving as much access, but also managing the meeting in such a way that we can conduct the business. So I, I'd, I'd like to, um, I'm fine with if we cut it off at 6.30, they have their hands raised. Um, and, and then, but do we, I, I guess I'd like to give the same consideration if we're doing that with online, and I feel like we should be doing the same thing with people who are here. And it, it pains me, Allie, to hear reminders of why not to do the video, because I'd really like to push for the video, because part of this is recognizing our neighbors and personalizing when, when you have to have a face to your comments and your our neighbors. I think it just it humanizes our work a lot more. So. I know we can't require it, but it's good to encourage it so that it's it's relational civic space. So those are my thoughts. Oh, and as for temporary, uh, I'm fine with temporary uh, if we feel like there's other things we want to revisit. But if this is the only thing in council rules that seems to be coming up for us, then um, I just assume we adopt it so that we're doing consistent communication and not having to say, hey, community, it's this. and then and, three months saying, okay, well now it's actually this, because as we learn, communicating takes a lot of effort. Councillor Snell. Thank you. Uh, one quick question first, and if it's a silly question, it won't be my last. Um, is there any sort of a connection or requirement that it, when they give the address that it actually has to be in Wheat Ridge? And, and they can't, no, that's not a thing, okay. Um, I think the reason that is asked probably at council meetings to give it some perspective. Is this person which district or whatever in Wee Ridge or coming? Is there a comment from a, coming from another community? Yep. So it just gives you some perspective. I don't think legally we need to ask an address. No, um, we ask because ninety percent of the time people will say it really helps council members to know mm -hmm. not only are they in the city or not, but what you know district where are they, and that's useful. If people say no, I'm not comfortable with that, then then that's fine too, sure. you know, because you don't want to exclude people uh, by virtue of requiring them to give their address. Sure, okay. Um, thank you for that clarification. I am in support of uh, the pre-registration, um, and I do think it is, there's a fine line between, you know, not having a knee-jerk reaction, we certainly don't want to do that, but also being proactive and making sure that folks know that we are not going to stand for what happened last week. So, thank you. Uh, Councilor Dozman. I would just like to vocalize my support in pushing back the deadline. Um, I, I, I would prefer to allow people to sign up as, as close to the beginning of the meeting as possible, um, just in the event that they had every intention of being here and, and for whatever reason couldn't be, um, and, and still giving them the opportunity to speak or like, Councilmember Holtine said that you know you're just spurred to come and hopefully they'll just show up because they live close enough and I, I I think you know our residents of Wheat Ridge tend to be the, the most um, observers of Channel Eight but uh, yeah I, I'd like to push that back as as uh, much as possible but I I do think that pre-registering um, in the event that we have to address something like this again in the future would be beneficial and as for temporarily or, or permanent I agree with Councilmember Holtine if if this is going to be the only change, then um, I, I think we should make it, you know, change our council rules. Um, but if we're going to be considering other options, then, then maybe doing that all in like a holistic package. Thank you. In this order, Weaver, Stites, and Hoppy. Weaver? I was just curious, uh, well, I have two questions. First of all, were, was the public able to see the list of names that we saw on the, on the screen? 
I don't believe so. I think you have to be a, um, a Allie, can you hear that question? I think you have to be a. Yeah. Okay. Analyst. They wouldn't have been able to see it. Yeah, you have to be a panelist to okay. see. So is there any legal way, because it was very obvious after a few minutes, just based on the incredibly rude names that were, that were posted there, um, is there any way we can recognize or say be, this is this is a a hoax basically right this is these are not real people because what what they wrote was also very inflaming i thought too uh with the names that were that were listed and so i was just curious if there is a way of recognizing because it took us about five or ten minutes, but then it was very clear what was happening. And, and yet, I felt like there was no way that we, we could stop what, what we knew was going to continue when it was very obvious. Um, so yeah, I, I was just curious. I'm glad those names were not reported, um, but yeah. Mr. Dahl, do you want to speak to that and the First Amendment implications, I suppose? Sure. Um, you know, it is the First Amendment, and so it cuts both ways. And the fact that you you hear five statements that you really don't agree with, that are abhorrent, et cetera, you've set up a forum where you've said to people, non-agenda items, we will hear your comments. And if you, when you set that forum up, and I mean, I know you know this, you have to take those comments. And the fact that you didn't like nine of them in a row does not mean that you can't take the comments. What the council did was I think the right thing to it observed what was happening kind of in real time and made an adjustment you know with the time frame that was your motion and limiting the amount of time uh, and that was fine but um, it, the, the you know the names people give and what they say uh, is that becomes something you you've invited and so you you've got to take it now there's also one of the main themes that came out of the attorney's listserv was, you know, it cuts both ways, which means that, that you are not required to sit there and not call things out as lies and not call things out as horrendous. And you did so during council member comments. One thing you can consider, it would change the dynamic a little bit, is feel free, you know, you could consider actually responding to speakers, saying, okay, before the next speaker, I want to say that was a lie and that was terrible. And you have the right, you know, you have the same First Amendment rights. Now you structure that as you choose. The way it's been done here is you save your, you save those comments and you do them at the end. It may be that council would want to have something more of a real time ability to respond, which is really more re responsive to the concern you're raising than some kind of here's the list and let's sort of show on screen who they are. And, not sure that that, but it's, I think it's more responsive to the heart of what you're raising. Yeah, certainly. I, I just was wondering when, if there was anything we could do when it's very obvious what is, what is happening, um, because I I do think we felt I, I at least I did I felt very angry and wanted to respond in some way and uh, anyway. Let me, let me talk for just a minute because um, the time to do that is the way that we structure our public comment. And there's a couple of, a, a couple of things, I run the meeting, and one of the, one of the tools that I have to limit a public comment is, as Councillor Hultine said, we've got too, much, too many people talking for too long if we do three minutes and we have business to do in this council after this, after this, this part in the uh, in the agenda. So th that's the balance that you have, um, with respect to people being able to really and the Zoom that we're using it for is really a telephone. So it's very familiar to our parents and our grandparents. This form of communication, and we're allowing people to come into the meeting where we used to only allow them to come in here and speak or to write a letter to be read at council, now we, now we invite the public in to speak on the telephone. 
the way to understand, and you have to, you know, if you're going to sign, if you're going to come in and speak here, you come in and you sign up. So you sign up and public comment starts. Mr. Dahl goes back, gets the list, and this is the list of speakers. And, and I think that we're, we're fair to, to say the, the speakers that have signed up are the people that are going to speak here tonight. Mm -hmm. We can have, afford the public that phones in, and I think it's good that we have some extend that as far as possible. But I should have a list of the people that are going to join us on the telephone mm -hmm. with their name and their phone, their phone number or their, their IP address. As, and I think we capture that information, right, when, when they come on or? We, we can. We can see. Yeah. I mean, you know, so, and, and, and so that I'm able to look at, you know, you have a few minutes to look at, well, these are the people that are signed in, you know, it's between Mr. Dahl, you know, handing it to me and getting off the podium. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's showtime, you know, so, uh, well, the first one on the list is, is uh, you know, Bill Smith or, or whoever. Um, but at least if you have the comments that are coming on the phone, you've got the list of speakers that you're going, that are going to speak at tonight's meeting. And they, they've made a decision they want to speak, we're going to listen to them speak, but you're able to say, well, this is how much time is allocated to it, and if we, and if we need to cut time to two minutes or one minute, uh, or there are other things, and, and the Council of Holteen brought up uh, the 45-minute uh, uh, proposals that we use at Dr. Cog, you know, we'll take 40 foot comment for 45 minutes, and then after that, we'll take public comment after the, after the meeting. I'm not a fan of that. We've never done, you know, the COG has never, in my history there, gotten into, you know, if you get one speaker to come and speak. And, and Mayor Pro Tim Stites was, was right. From the time that I've been here, this hadn't happened. You can count, count on your nose the number of times that last week's events happened. But I think, uh, you know, we, and, and then to, you know, other, other, other cities I've, I've been asking, they, they, they take comment, uh, they, they allow them to tape comment. And I said, no, I don't want to tape comment because what if you want to listen, what if you listen to it? You say, well, I don't want to hear that tonight. You're in a real pickle, constitutional pickle with that. So I think, you know, you try to, you try to give everybody a fair chance. They can either show up, sign up and talk. They can, they can call in by six o'clock <coughs> if that allows staff enough time to, to generate a list, here's the people that are calling in, then, um, you know, we've, we've taken care of it. And we still can't, you know, limit the content of their speech, you know. So that's going to be something we're going to need to close our ears. But when I first got on a council, there was a gentleman that was making the, making the rounds in Jefferson County and, and uh, you know, and, and was up in, uh, in Westminster and out in Aurora, and we had, you know, we had prepped for that five years ago, not or six years ago, not thinking that it would not be someone in person, but someone online. You know, so, but we dodged that bullet, and you know, there may be other people that show up doing that. But I think really, if we can set a set of rules, and I was looking at our current rules, um, we enacted in June 1st of 2021. So they're they're moving on to two years plus old. Uh, I haven't looked at them, but but we should you know, make sure that we're clear with, with these procedures on it so that you can look at the rules and say, yes, we have a rule for that. Anyway, that's, I'm big on being a, a you know, a country of laws, uh, you know, the rule of law is pretty important. So, sorry, I have Mayor Pro Tem Stites in the, in the queue. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Stites. I just wanted to mention that we do have some tools. Oh, this is nice. um, it doesn't matter that they're, they're, they're fake names like the um, attorney has already opined on, but we can respond more quickly, right? And so this hasn't happened to us before. Um, you know, me making the motion to suspend the, to suspend the rules and then we put the time limit on it and the, and the you know, per minute comment, we can respond more quickly next time. So, so if we are looking at the list and it's starting to look suspicious, then, you know, we can do that. We just have to be on our toes. Additional discussion. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'd like to make a consensus that we move forward with uh, the second option that we require uh, registration, let's say, up until 6.30 when the meeting starts. And then uh, is that enough time, do you think, Mr. Goff? 
not, not if the mayor wants a, a, a list. printed list. Gotta have, um, gotta have a six, list six is going to be pushing it too, can but we, we, we can try six and see how it goes. Let's um, try six yep. um, and, and try that then. So uh, allow registration up until 6 p.m. the day of the meeting, and uh, uh, we make the – well, and let me ask Mr. Dahl, you said that you had a kind of a list of recommendations mm -hmm. you were going to bring forward, so is that going to be here in the next few months? Yeah, so right away I've, I've okay. created a draft list just over the you know last couple of days. Okay. And um, what I would suggest is you'll have what you want to do right away, registration, maybe one or two other things. And then I would like to bring to you probably at a study session quickly, here's the Southern list. And it's kind of the totality of what I've been able to learn. And it may be that that inspires you to adjust slightly but not much, you know, I agree with the, okay, this happened, but it doesn't mean we have to turn things completely upside down, but I think it would be helpful for you to see what other people are doing around this, and, and it may inspire you to adjust it a little bit. So I would suggest maybe a, a two-stage thing here, what you're talking about tonight, right away, uh, and then I can bring this, and you can say, okay, let's add this, uh, uh, this additional item, and then trigger it for a rules revision. I wouldn't like start rewriting the rules mm -hmm. until now and a week from now, because among other things, I think it will be well for the, the mayor to have in the rules, the ability to do very much what council member Hoppy's motion allowed him to do, you know, changing, mm -hmm. limiting it to a certain time, uh, limiting the amount of time so that he kind of has those tools already for the, what maybe won't happen again, but if it does, we won't have to like do a recess, mm. you know, and then figure out, okay, are we going to run this motion, which actually happened, I thought happened pretty smoothly. But we could probably build that into the rules a little bit. So I'm taking, what I'm taking too long to say is, is maybe next meeting you do a, another motion and yet again to suspend the rules to have this, whatever you're going to do. But then pretty quickly after that, I can get you the list. We can decide what things ought to change within the rules themselves, and we'll get that codified. Okay. Is that all right? Okay. Cool. Uh, uh, to Mayor, uh, uh, Councillor Dozeman had a, uh, we got a few more questions, I guess, so right. if you can hold up. Okay. You, you're okay? Is it, was, okay. Was there anybody? Okay. So let's go to, let's go to Holteen and then Hoppy. I don't have a question. Okay. So I guess, uh, back to civic process communicating our cutoff for signing in and for changing with a week's notice when people can join on zoom i mean i i know nobody wants what happened last week to happen again next week but i would prefer we pick a date out a little bit that we're changing that sign because i mean right now people in our community think they can get on at <coughs> 6 30 and i think a week's notice for that change is just not enough, I think, especially with like the holidays and stuff. So I guess I would, okay, I just, I would like us to consider a little more reasonable notice, like <coughs> just even two weeks or until the, the December meeting, just to give people, so that we're able to communicate it, get it out on socials, make sure it's in front of people, that they, they know that if they want to participate, they've got to register by six o'clock or whatever that kind of. Uh, Councillor Hoppy? Yeah, I have a suggestion that um, maybe for the, <clears throat> we do it until 6.30. We don't have a printed list necessarily at 6.30, but we do that for the next couple of weeks while <coughs> also informing people that it will it will switch to 6 o'clock. Then, then that gives us a chance to notify at every meeting also this is going to be happening. And, you know, first off, you know, we're, we're asking for a pre-register, but then also... <coughs> This is this is going to be happening, and, and it's going to be you know six o'clock in the future. Is that? But it's it's the pre-registration that we still people have to get used to before mm -hmm. next Monday. I think is what Rachel's mm. speaking to. It's not the time. Well, but you can get on if we're keeping it until six thirty for the first couple of meetings. Then they can hop on at six thirty. Yeah, and I suppose, but it, they'll might be surprised that they have to register. Yeah. Could we? Um, could we, in the interim, uh, you know, uh, when we get, to, when we pick up the list of the people that have signed up to speak, so I know the speakers that are in the hall, uh, could we say, if you're online and want to speak, raise your hand now. And 
and we we see, give it a minute or two minutes, and then and then we those are the speakers that we have. I don't, I don't know administratively. That's going to be very easy. People come on every other second well, online. You, uh, you know, so who's got the yellow hand up? So so well, you're going to cut them off. I don't, I'm not sure where you're going with this. No. Uh, so if their if their hands not up by a certain time or when you call it, it will, well, and people I, come on, we're not gonna. It might be hard. It's just gonna be hard for us to manage. I think yeah, as staff. I mean, um, can you? Can you, and I don't know the technology. Can you take a screenshot of uh, <laughs> at a certain time? Could, when, um, may I? You may. Sorry, hi, Mayor and um, City Manager. Sorry to to butt in. Actually, I think I understand where you're where you're going with this, Mayor. Um, because to be honest, um, the the city of Eugene was recently Zoom bombed. Um, they require pre-registration, but they let it go right up until the start of the meeting. And so, um, frankly, it doesn't. I, I I would just like to say I'm not I'm not sure that how much that will help us um, deter what happened. But I think, Mayor, what you're suggesting is perhaps we stick closer to door number one. Um, do nothing, not require pre-registration, other than to say, when when you know when you open up public's right to speak, you say, um, anybody online that would like to speak, now is the time to raise your hand, and then at that point, the city clerk can kind of jot down the names. Um, you get through whoever's in the room, like you always do first, and then you turn to that list, and there's sort of no. Um, no new hands raised, I think, is what you're suggesting. Um, I I think we could try that, and maybe that's an option. Maybe maybe we start rather than jump into pre-registration, especially if there are concerns about getting the word out. Maybe we take more of an interim step. Uh, you know, I, it it seemed to make it seemed to make sense for me just in the interim because I do think we should have a good study session with Mr. Dahl to understand some of the more some of the other ideas that are around Councillor Hultin. Oh, I was just wondering if, if you could ask people to sorry, if you could ask people to raise their hands and then promote all those people to panelist. Mm -hmm. And then that you can't you can only well, but then, then they can turn then, their then we can zoom then we then we're subject to zoom bombing. We're we're opening the video screen instead of opening the telephone. So Okay. I yeah. I would argue for okay. just the telephone myself. All right. All right. Mr. Stites. I would argue that we don't go back and we just continue with what we were going with before because I think that our residents and our public, just kind of reading what I've read over the last couple of weeks, they kind of expect us to do something. Like, I, and I know I said that we shouldn't knee jerk react to anything, but adding a little bit of security just to make sure that this doesn't happen again, I think makes total sense. And I think the easiest way to do it is to cut it off at six and otherwise we're, we're just in the same we're, if we're asking for people to raise their hand we're in the same yeah. boat that we were in before so i think that we we can all promote it as best we can on social media you can send out a a blast to whoever but but i do think that we should cut it off at six and just move forward so um i'm going to ask for a consensus that we uh move forward with pre-registration we cut it off at six for and the we, next meeting for the next meeting and that we uh, make it temporary we can make another motion at that meeting um, until we have the study session with Mr. Dahl. So, consensus? Yeah, that's yes. okay. Got one. That's okay. okay with me. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's good. I mean, I I think we don't uh, you know we we may jerk the knee a little bit, but it's not a big knee, knee jerk, and and uh, right. we want to bring you know we've been sort of you know you know it's kind of ironic that. We, my thing has sort of been encouraging people to, you know, geez, I'll give you a little more time if you're here in the hall and haven't signed up, you know, come and speak, you know, and and it, we, you know, we got burned one time, but you know, let's be reasonable about how we how we sort of structure the meeting and have an or, you know, an organized flow so you know who's coming to speak. It's not that you can't come and speak, you know, everybody's welcome to come and speak. I, you know, on the. On the address thing, you know, when when the press queried me about that, I said, you know, I inherited that. I think the reason that we do it is to try to give our our council an idea of who's a constituent and who may not be a constituent. And I I think if you said, that, you know, are you a resident of Wheat Ridge? Yes or no? That that that's one question that's pretty legitimate and easy to answer. 
you know? If so, what council district are you in? That's another step further if that information. But, you know, I don't think we need to put people, you know, some people don't like to give their address anymore. It's, you know, maybe there is a little further away. But so those are some of the other things that I think that we would want to put on the, put on the agenda for a more thorough discussion. Okay? Anything else in staff reports? <laughs> That's it. Okay, okay. Thank you. Elected officials matters. You were out of town. You, you should have yeah. a report for us. Oh, my gosh. On, uh, uh, yeah. So Patrick and I were in Atlanta last week, and Wheat Ridge was recognized by NLC. We got, it was a, um, what did they call the part? The, the milestone. The milestone uh, award, which recognizes Wheat Ridge's 50-year um, membership. Uh, tenure with National League of Cities, and I was up there with uh, Salt Lake City and Youngstown, Ohio, and Sunnyvale, California. There were 11 communities altogether, um, although we were called West, West, Ridge? West Ridge, West Ridge, so they didn't get our name right, but um, it was pretty, pretty exciting to be up there and be recognized, and it was just, it was a great conference. They had phenomenal guest speakers, uh, including Jose Andres, and, um, uh, and just, a lot of, lot of great inspiration, but really that conference is all about talking to peers from across the country. And not only did I learn a lot, um, but also we're doing great things here in Wheat Ridge. And um, uh, Aletha, Kansas is really interested in our community policing model. And so it's just a great exchange of ideas. And um, so I just really wanna uh, thank the city for uh, letting, letting me go and uh, it was a good time, and, and Atlanta's pretty awesome. So, and uh, so that was my happy thing. And then I just I, I did want to make a comment about last Monday. Um, it really it it took a good at least full day for me to process what had happened. I mean, I we kind of processed a little bit on the dais, and I woke up the next morning. It was just really thick and heavy, and um, and I just want to recognize that that was a horrific experience on the dais, but every other minute in this community, even when it's people who I'm not agreeing with, we are surrounded by extraordinary humans in Wheat Ridge. And for as hard as last Monday was, Tuesday was just filled with a hundred little interactions with people that reminded me of why we do this and why it matters and things like that are gonna happen, but our community is better and stronger than that. And the outpouring of support from our community that I got on you know Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday was extraordinary. So um, while those, you know, the people who called in and lied to us and said some of the most horrific things I've ever heard, they don't know what this community is and how we treat each other and we do and i'm sorry for them they don't they don't know who they're messing with but i i do and we're incredible community and it's because of our people and i just want to recognize them and thank them thank you additional elected officials reports councillor snell I uh, just wanted to uh, mention I was at a wonderful event on Saturday morning, the uh, Feed Your Soul Fund Turkey Trot, and they are going to make it a annual, um, an annual event. It was great. I am so happy there's a turkey trot that's not 10,000 people on Sloan's Lake, um, and for it to be so close, but so many folks from Wheat Ridge there, so many great small businesses represented, vendors, and uh, it, you know, just representing their, their uh, organizations and businesses there. Um, and proceeds from the registration went to the uh, Feed the Future program, the backpack program that oh. happens at Stevens Elementary. Uh, and I talked to the organizers afterward, huge success, and they're hoping to double the participation next year. And that is, that's wonderful. And I just think also it's just a great event for our community. So just wanted to give a quick shout out there. Thank you. Councillor Dozman. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just um, build on that because uh, Council Member Snell and I were both at the Feed Your Soul Fitness Turkey Trot. So it was a wonderful uh, first year, a wonderful event for the community, really good showing of, of Wheat Ridge businesses um, and organizations. And so 
hope to see it double next year. And uh, if you're interested in taking any classes, definitely check out Future Soul Fitness. I've been doing some strength training there for a couple of months, and it's been a really fun program. Um, so definitely a good business to check out in the community. Thank you. Additional. Councillor Weaver. I just wanted to report that the way that I uh, uh, felt better after uh, our experience Monday is that I moved goats from one Wheat Ridge Park to another Wheat Ridge Park. So went from one side of Wheat Ridge to the other. So uh, east side Wheat Ridge, you got your goats in the house. <laughs> so uh, please go visit them at Happiness Gardens. They will be there for another few weeks. Right. December. Good. Thanks. Anybody else? Councillor Stites is okay. Councillor Hoppy. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. Had the opportunity to go to the uh, business association breakfast meeting last week. Uh, always a lot of fun. Uh, great businesses there. Uh, it was uh, Mr. Biscuit's one year ribbon cutting on Friday, uh, as well as uh, one of our local chiropractors. So that was uh, really cool to. Uh, see our business community growing and, and doing phenomenal. Um, and uh, after Monday, it, was, it was, was a little surreal, but I think what was really cool about our community is I had a number of people reach out and say that they wanted to come either you know, next Monday or whenever it is and, and uh, give some positive comments and, and talk about great things in Wheat Ridge, great things going on in the world, whatever it is. So um, we do live in a great community and, and, uh, and thankfully those people that called in on Monday aren't part of it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Hoppe, anything tonight? Um, I had a, just a couple of things. Uh, a week ago on Monday, I, it was really my honor to cut to do a ribbon cutting at the I-70 32nd Avenue Bridge with CDOT. Uh, they're r really great people. They, they, this was a great project for them. I'll tell you. You know, Director Liu was there, and and uh, and uh, former Congressman Perlmutter showed up because he had uh, he had been in the groundbreaking. But uh, everybody really enjoys that, that project. They're really they're really jazzed about. Uh, the Harlan Street Bridge and the, and the Ward Street Bridge and are jazzed about doing other bridges in our community and, uh, and other stuff. I also went uh, last week to the Airse Arvada Wheat Ridge Service Ambassadors to Youth Breakfast and a really inspiring group there. We, we, we support that group which provides um, uh, uh, scholarship funding for kids to go to Red Rock, so underprivileged kids, so that was really great. Um, on Friday, I was participated in the uh, Arvada Chamber of Commerce has a mayor's roundtable up in Arvada. So the new Arvada, uh, Lauren Simpson, or the new Arvada, the new mayor from Arvada, Lauren Simpson, was there, and uh, the mayor pro tem from Golden, and the um, mayor from uh, you know, am I forgetting another? I'm forgetting another mayor. Which other mayor was there? Um, anyway, another mayor. But we had a had, uh, Mayor McNally from Westminster, but. We had a good uh, a good program there. People, uh, you know, Wheat Ridge scores really well. I'm so proud of being being the mayor here. You just there's so many great things to talk about. Um, we went to two two ribbon cuttings last week: a color osteopathic and integrative health on 44th. And as uh, Mayor Pro Tem Stites said, Mr. Biscuits, what a great group over there. Um, I've had more comments about about what we did right last week than anybody said that we did wrong so I want to I want to really thank you all for for stepping up there and being part of a group that that uh, addressed the situation and were responsible about it and uh, and really I think did the right thing so uh, I want to make sure that we always afford all the constitutional rights that our citizens are entitled to that we conduct these meetings fairly and openly and that we, and that we get our business done and I think we did as good as we could there and uh, lastly Thursday is Thanksgiving Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Anything else? Okay. With that, we'll stand adjourned. Thank you.